right uh, so now the broadcast should be started mm -hmm. um, here we go <laughs> So today, uh, this is a tutorial project uh, of our Korea structure, um, and uh, today, uh, m uh, myself, Naoto Chia, and also uh, uh, Hayato Saigo is going to give a, a tutorial presentation on the category theory, uh, specifically for consciousness researchers. And uh, uh, we are planning to uh, do it for roughly like one and a half hour uh, and uh, we'll take questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. All uh, right. Now, yeah. recording has started? Yes. Okay. I mean, uh, it's broadcasted on YouTube. Oh, uh -huh. okay, good. Sorry. If you have any sound uh, problem, uh, let me know. I think it should be okay. Nobody has complained yet. All right. So uh, in terms of the format, uh, we'll take a break after roughly 30 minutes. Um, I'll take, I'll start to count. And uh, we strongly encourage any questions uh, you may have, and we'll try to answer all the questions, both in Zoom and also uh, chat box, as well as in the uh, YouTube comments. And um, there's no point in, um, you know, making this as a pure lecture like uh, format uh, because mm -hmm. some of the, you know, tutorials already available on YouTube. So uh, don't worry about the time. Uh, we we'll launch the follow up uh, tutorial if the if we can't get to the uh, end of this in you know, a tutorial uh, today. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, here is the link uh, if you are interested uh, for the details of the. Um, you know, uh, papers. Uh, the left side is uh, written in Japanese and the uh, uh, central one is a preprint for free and the right side is the uh, neuroscience of consciousness, the former one and the latest version. All right. And uh, in terms of the contents, uh, we uh, plan to follow the structure of the paper uh, published in neuroscience of consciousness. And uh, so we'll start with the category and then uh, uh, go to functor, and then natural transformation. Um, these three things are the uh, basic concepts of the category theory. Mm. Anything to add, Hayato? Fine? No, fine. Yeah. And then uh, we'll talk about the uh, functor category and home functor. And this is uh, these two components are necessary to understand the critical uh, component of today's uh, lecture uh, tutorial which is the Yone Dalemma, okay? And then on the, uh, along the way, we also uh, mentioned two types of the different levels of the sameness. One is a categorical isomorphism and another one is a categorical uh, equivalence. So uh, the goal of this tutorial is to understand why uh, or what the Yone Dalemma is, uh, which uh, we sometimes talk in our quality structure uh, lectures as well as the videos. And also, uh, why we think it can be used for uh, characterizing queria. This is the figure, the last figure of our paper uh, using this, um, this one, this one uh, figure seven. And it's, uh, it's called checker shadow illusion. And uh, this basically sh uh, shows or, you know, um, shows a point of the way we see things are highly dependent or you know pretty much determined by the relationship with others and here it's a relationship with a spatial context but also you know things that you are not seeing at the time is also uh, quite relevant as well and then uh, uh, in particular we want to talk about uh, what does it mean for aquaria to constitute a category you know th this meaning of the category is not the kind of the category that you associated in the psychology or philosophy, but there is some kind of a connection, right, uh, Hayato? Yeah, a little. Uh, the, actually, the Mark Eilenberg and Mark Ben borrowed from the, the term from Aristotle, Aristotle and Kant. 
but uh, I think the beginners should not um, concern not so much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you know, it's better probably to think about the category as a completely different things than what yeah. you have in your uh, mind in a psychological terms. Okay, then uh, next uh, we'll talk about what does it mean for the structure to be related or similar or same with the structure of information. Um, so we talk about, you know, uh, structure of the query and the structure of information to be same or similar, but what does it mean exactly? So that's the uh, important thing. And uh, the reason why we think this is possible to do in the, uh, using category theory is that the category theory is in fact uh, the theory for the structure, mathematical theory for structure. And so if you want to talk about the similarity or uh, relations between the structures, then the natural uh, you know, place to go would be the category theory. And the alternative uh, things that we tend to use is like you know, set theory or like graph theory or something like that. But uh, that, that's sort of, you know, it, it can be subsumed in the category theory, in fact. And then the next one is that uh, how can we characterize and quantify structure using category theory? So uh, as I said, you know, um, category theory is literally like a structure, uh, mathematical theory for uh, tools for structure. And how can we, um, you know, quantify structure using that? That's the question. And then uh, also, uh, it's a sort of a running in parallel, but it's also quite important to for us uh, to introduce this, you know, idea of the different levels of the sameness. Mm. And uh, this is probably not really available in other kind of uh, theory, even uh, philosophy or other fields. Um, so category theory offers many different ways to define sameness and uh, in a mm. precise manner, coherently. And that's a very useful thing to understand. Hayato, do you want to say a few words on this? Yeah. yeah um, actually, in modern mathematics, there is many kind of the sameness, uh, not only in category theory, but the uh, uh, important thing is that uh, category theory can treat the very uh, meta level sameness between, for example, the two theories, two worlds or two regions, and uh, its sameness is um, a very uh, lax and but very rigorous so very flex flexible one uh, for, for example the categorical equivalence equivalence between categories uh, maybe um, now uh, we we'll talk about it after yeah Steve do you have any comments so far fine okay that's all fine. All right, good. So let's uh, move on. If you have, if you don't have any further questions or comments, uh, okay. Um, Amin had the question: uh, What does it mean uh, by different levels of sameness with respect to the concept of the query? So that's exactly what we are going to explain. But roughly spe speaking, um, one way to define sameness of the query is that uh, I see one particular green at a particular time at a particular location. So that is going to be extremely tight kind of you know, definition of the sameness. And that means uh, that, that is called identity in category theory. Okay. Everything has to be the same. And that, that happens only things on itself. Right? However, it's kind of completely useless you know, there, there is some kind of you know, use, usefulness about this precision, but what we want to also talk about is something like you know the similarity of uh, let's say this gray and this gray. You feel like you know these two are similar, same, right? But from the beginning, the location is already different. So if you think about an you know, aquaria including the distinction of the location, which is going to be very important then those A and B cannot be the same. But, you know, with a relaxed kind of, you know, combination, uh, you know, definition, we can talk about the color is equivalent, for example. Not identical, 
and the same or different, uh, same or similar is more precisely defined as the term called equivalent here. Fine? Okay. But you know, as you go, uh, we'll see uh, more of the example. Okay. So let's go. Uh, and uh, here's the references uh, uh, for for those who are interested in um, this category theory, but uh, with a uh, quite you know uh, uh, all, almost no, no ba background. I personally felt uh, you know uh, found this you know, Spivak's David Spivak's category theory for scientists uh, uh, very interesting and engaging and understandable. But you know, sometimes you know it uh, intentionally has a very difficult example as well. But this one is highly recommended for those who are who want to work from the examples. And then the Lovier uh, and Lovier's conceptual mathematics starts with a very basic set theory, and it's extremely access accessible as well. But it builds things very slowly, so you don't get to the kind of interesting uh, concepts of the category theory until really very end. So it's, it's good and a great, uh, great book, but uh, it can be also frustrating to, if you want to get to the point of the category theory. And then uh, another one would be Fong and also uh, uh, Spivak's uh, invitation to apply the category theory. This is uh, in a sense, you know, opposite of the Lovier's uh, conceptual mathematics. It's going to the, so the frontier of the category theory from the beginning, really. And each chapter is uh, going like this, like exponentially, exp you know, uh, going uh, from extremely easy example to very difficult things. But it composed, uh, composed of seven chapters or something like that. And uh, it's again, you know, um, I uh, recommend it if, you're, if you can take the challenge. And then for mathematicians who can now, uh, you know, understand uh, things and also, you know, uh, build, wants to build things uh, from the be uh, beginning, then maybe Awadi and also Lainster's book would be great. Um, any, any words to add, Hayato or Stephen? I think the Awadi's book and Lainster's book is uh, not only for mathematicians, but some kind of mathematically oriented people like philosophers or something so not only mathematicians but the mathematically oriented people i think yeah you know, i found another book that i found really accessible if you want to get more into the technical side mm -hmm. is a book by harold sims uh, introduction to category theory because it takes it from the viewpoint of order you know mm -hmm. simple order theory is like a simple uh, mm -hmm. Partial orders and so forth, but like simple, very simple categories where there's only at most one arrow between the the objects. And so, <clears throat> from a <laughs> cognitive complexity viewpoint, it really simple. A lot of things become a lot more accessible when you don't have to think about many arrows at the same time. Uh, I found his book quite interesting. I see. What what what's the name of that author? Harold. Uh, you see that? Uh, Simon. Yeah, uh, Simmons. Harold Simmons. Yeah. Simmons. Uh, I've blurred out my. <laughs> Sorry, I can't see it. I blurred out my screen, but. Um, yeah, maybe you can type it in the chat, and uh, later um, I'll yeah. change it. Okay, so uh, but but there are lots of books, and uh, you know, uh, you know, you can probably find uh, many uh, books on the uh, references as well. All right. So let's get started. And also, yeah. also some comments. Yep. Um, okay. Um, I, I don't know, but oh yeah, uh, in comments. The, uh huh. Isaac. Isaac. Isaac so asks, uh, uh, "Do you have opinions? Have you heard of Alf, Alf's algebra, chapter zero? Mm -hmm. It's both abstract algebra and the category theory at once." Mm -hmm. I didn't know, but maybe it's a very good one. Steve, do you know? Um, yeah, I've heard of it. Um, uh, I, I, have, I don't have it, so I, I can't comment on that particular book. Okay, then, yeah, we know we don't know. Sorry okay. about that. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. 
then uh, unless you have any further question. So uh, let's get started with the, what, what is a category? So this uh, figure one of the, our paper is concise summary of what the category is. <laughs> the maybe with this, uh, you may not understand what this means basically, but uh, you can imagine may, maybe as a start, you can think about this F or G or um, things like that, you know, these arrows as a level of uh, the larger than or higher than equal relationship between the different levels of consciousness. The, it's called a pre-order structure. And then A could be considered as a like dead uh, state and B could be deeply anesthetized state and then C could be half fully awake. And in, the, in this case, a is uh, uh, less than or equal to B, and B is less than or equal to C, and then these two pathways can be composed into A to C. That's F then B, you, you can read it like this way, or if uh, you are mathematically oriented, you may want to read it as a G of F, but I find it easy to say F then G, okay? So the point here is that uh, when there are two arrows, then you can always compose, combine, to get the same effect. From, if you can go from A to B and B to C, then you can also go from A to C directory. Any question? Fine? All right. But th this means that, you know, we, we can also talk about uh, what, what is not category, but directory we can talk already here that uh, if you have, uh, let's say, three neurons, A, B, C, then even if A and B is connected and then B and C is connected, it doesn't necessarily mean that A and C is directly connected. So if you think about F as a relation of the connection, X is connected to Y, then that kind of you know, arrow or relationship between these things do not compose a category, okay? Category, the requirement is that you know any kind of relation has to be composable. That's a very important point. That's uh, what what this A means. So far fine. And then the mm -hmm. but but, yeah. but maybe we if we focus on the not directly but uh, intermediately or some indirectly related by some direct uh, uh, connection, then we have a category. Right. So, uh, in general, uh, in mathematics, there is a notion called uh, directed graph, uh, which uh, does not, in general, satisfy the composition uh, axiom, uh, or A then B axiom, uh, but uh, we can construct by uh, constructing a category, which is called the free, the free category of uh, the directed graphs, this is uh, just uh, we explained in neural example. Right. So I, I think this directly or not directly, the some kind of intermediary connected is a very good example of a category. Right. Yeah. So the point here is that, that you know, as Hayato said, you know, almost any cases, if you, if you work hard or if you are creative enough, then you can make this kind of, you know, uh, condition to be satisfied. So even if, you know, a neuron directory, A di directory influences B uh, or something like that does not constitute a category. If you relax it into something like, you know, A influences B in some way, then that kind of uh, relation can constitute a category. And that's called, Free a uh, construction of a free category from a directed mm -hmm. graph. Mm -hmm. Yes, sounds okay. And, uh, yeah, and uh, there is one point maybe the uh, everyone uh, who is a beginner to the category theory is that uh, there may be two or zero or infinite number of arrows between fixed two objects. Uh, as now introduced the uh, notion of category. Uh, taking an example of order theoretical, like uh, Steve uh, said, that uh, there is a category that satisfying um, there is at most 
one arrow between the two pair of objects. Uh, it is called a pre-order, pre-order, and the pre-order is a very good example and a very good starting point to get into the category theory for understanding. But uh, note that the pre-order is very special kind of category, and in general, that there is many kind of arrows, many arrows between the pair of objects. Right. So ju just to give you a kind of a, um, example, uh, maybe, you know, one arrow would be like a similar or um, indistinguishably similar in terms of a color. And then another arrow could be uh, in indistinguishable in terms of the shape or in terms of space and things like that. So each of these can have a different kind of, you know, uh, rules of the uh, composition and then uh, as our arrows. And that, you know, many, many arrows between two objects can characterize the, um, what, what this, you know, nature of these objects or category is. Okay, but then to simplify, if you want to start with extremely, you know, uh, uh, for fast kind of example, just one arrow between two uh, objects, which is like less than or equal is a good one. And then think about uh, level of consciousness as a category is, you know, a uh, recommended kind of approach. Mm. Maybe the very easy uh, example, which is not pre-order, is uh, uh, the category of states and state transition. Mm -hmm. uh, if you consider the physical states A, B, C, as a, some kind of states in physics, like some dynamics or something. And uh, there is many process between state A to B, mm. like uh, adiabatic one uh, or some AP temperature uh, one or something. So yeah, isothermal one or so the, the, and also there is many uh, processes uh, between infinitely many processes between two states. So in that case, um, the, uh, it, it is a very easy example, uh, which is uh, the category which is not pre-order. Yeah, that's that's great actually because you know it's highly relevant when you think about the brain states uh, and its you know transition. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now also, yes. <clears throat> yes. In the chat. Yes. About your, your point about direct and indirect? Yes. Okay, yeah. So first, uh, let, let me take the question from Chuin and then Masahumi next. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you. So Chuin says, does F then G count as indirect connection or direct as uh, F and G? So I, I think it's direct, right? Yeah, um, so it it's, uh, depends in context. The yeah. important thing is, uh, what you call the arrow, so or morphism. If you consider the uh, F or G as some kind of indirect, uh, indirect connection, then uh, F G is indirect one. Uh, and uh, if there is a, actually you focus on the di only direct one and some graph like. Uh, Completely complete graph or something, then you can interpret uh, FG as a direct connection. So the point is that uh, it depends on, on the context. Steve? Yes, uh, yeah. just to follow up on Hypo's point, the, the, the semicolon is just the operator, actually. So, for example, in the context of um, a, a multiplication or addition, it's like saying it's two plus three equals five uh, direct or indirect well, it doesn't in that interpretation doesn't really make sense because but formally is the, <clears throat> the composition is just an operation taking two arrows and sending it to another arrow so as Hayato said it depends on how you want to interpret the arrows as to whether or not you want to say that they're direct or indirect for example if they if you interpret the arrows as pathways like in the neural net as a graph as Hayato said then yeah sure you can think of it as indirect or, or direct if you interpret it as just, uh, for example, an algebra, like um, uh, the category is just, uh, the arrows are just numbers and the operation, the composition operation is just multiplication or addition, then it just, uh, all it is is just an, op an operation on those two 
uh, arrows to produce another arrow. Yeah, yeah, that's good. All right, and then Mazafumi? Yeah, so when we consider the many arrows between A and B or A and C, then the you know compositionality must hold for every arrow. Ah, uh, no, no. Um, only the uh, the pair of the arrow fit satisfies the condition that this arrow f. Okay. The codomain of f, codomain means uh, target of f, is equal to the domain of g, the starting point source of g. So you cannot compose this kind of this kind of uh, arrow directly. Yeah, but probably what Matt Masami is also uh, mm -hmm. concerned is, let's say, you know, uh, maybe my example was wrong, but let's say if the top uh -huh. one is a uh, similar in terms of the color yeah and then the oh. another one is a similar in terms of the space or something like that or shape yes. can we yes. compose right exactly yeah that's my question yeah i think the it is difficult uh, to interpret uh, naturally the, the composition of this c and s in general so in that case, now the example is not example of category. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, if you can, if now can define the, this natural yeah. notion of composition, then uh, I think that now the example becomes a real example, real example of category. But I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't see uh, this is really real example or not. Mm. Possible, but, but I, I, I don't know. Yep. But formally, every pair of these compatible arrows must have another arrow. But it's well, that's two different pairs map to the same arrow. So mm -hmm. if you compose F and G and you get an arrow at H, you could also compose F dash and G dash and also get H. So, but, you know, there must be, it must be sent. The composition operation must send those two pairs to an arrow that's in that category. Otherwise, it's not a cap. Yeah. But it depends <clears throat> whether or not that suits your application, depends on the interpretation. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, we haven't actually worked out this kind of many arrow kind of application in con mm -hmm. consciousness research. So, um, you know, what I said was probably not uh, really, you know, appropriate. Um, but uh, we probably think that we can do mm -hmm. this kind of thing in the future. So that, that's the sort of state. So uh, shall we take a four minute break right now? Uh, now that we yeah. passed uh, 30 minutes. Okay, see you later in five minutes.
Okay, so let's get started. Um, can you hear me? All right, so uh, there was a question on the chat box. Uh, what is not a category? And I realized that uh, I didn't define a category very clearly, so sorry. So um, it's uh, the, the simplest kind of the definition is that the ob uh, category is a uh, um, set of or collection of uh, objects such as A, B, C, and also arrows such as F or G or H here. And uh, when these objects and uh, arrows satisfies uh, the following conditions like um, uh, this you know, A and B and C, then that is called a category. And if uh, none of them, uh, any of them doesn't um, uh, get satisfied or if it's not composed of objects or arrows, then it's not a category. And as uh, Steve uh, has already kind of uh, replied, uh, in general, direct graph is not a category because they need to be a loop on the every R vertex, not on, nor on edge for every path. But um, just let me explain the another property, B and C as well, to uh, make it easy to probably understand. So the B is uh, called uh, conditions of associativity. So if there isn't a path or a relation from A to B to C to D, that is related by uh, arrow F, G, and H, then you can go from A to C first and then to get to D or A to B and then B to D. Uh, either way is fine. This also has to be satisfied. And also another, uh, in another one is called a unit. Each of the object has to have an arrow onto itself. And this relates to the kind of the identity relationship that we talked about in the beginning of the um, the part where uh, I answered in, um, in relation to uh, Amin's question. A is identical to A. So they, this kind of arrow has to be present. And then you have to be able to compose this uh, one A, identity for uh, A, with any kind of arrow, like a, a F that goes from A to B. And the B also itself has an um, identity arrow, one B and then one B has to be able to compose with uh, something before. And so that's the reason why I said that, you know, uh, we can't have something like larger than uh, relations as a sort of a fun, uh, you know, a relation or arrow uh, to make it category. <clears throat> because, you know, A is not, <coughs> sorry, A is not uh, uh, larger than uh, A precisely. Uh, if you define larger than uh, in a precise way, right? So this um, this kind of relation makes collection of objects and the relation are uh, to be not the category. Okay. So hopefully this is fine uh, with you. And uh, if there is any further question, we can uh, take in um, chat or uh, now. All right, otherwise we'll move on. So category is uh, the first step, but then uh, the next step is the, uh, so this is actually a written definition of the category, actually. I, I should have actually shown this first. Uh, but, but this, you know, if you uh, write out uh, the definition of a category in words, oh, this is the category. Um, so co collection of all objects to be considered as a category, they must satisfy the following five axioms. One is the arrow has been solved and target and uh, uh, domain and co-domain. And for every object, there is a self-referential arrow uh, called identity. And the pair of arrows is composable if the domain of one arrow equals the co-domain co of another. And the identities do not change as, uh, other arrows by composition and uh, composition is associative. So if none of, uh, some of them doesn't uh, get satisfied, then it's not the category, okay? So here, uh, the first kind of the uh, sameness or categorical isomorphism. Uh, when two objects, A and B, are, uh, that, that is in the, uh, some kind of category, C, they are called isomorphic if there is an invertible arrow called isomorphism between them. And what does it mean is that the, when the arrow 
uh, from A to B, F exists, then, um, then uh, there's an arrow that goes from B to A, G. And composing F to F and then G equals to 1A, and G then F uh, becomes the same as 1B. I guess it's a bit complicated. So, I mean, it's if you compare the definition of isomorphism uh, defined in the philosophy or somewhere, it's even more complicated. So I, I find this definition really satisfying. So to draw a um, kind of uh, uh, figure, this kind of self-referential arrow is 1A, and then this is another arrow, 1B. And what it means is that uh, when arrow from A to B exists, and uh, it's an F, and then there is almost also G from uh, B, to G, B to A. And then F to G is the same as 1A, and then G to F, G then F is the same as 1B. That's, uh, that's what it means. All right, Yota. Now, yes. I think your your audio is, is recover now. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, then that's fine. Uh, yeah. okay. Can you hear me now? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I, I just want to comment the, the terminology. I think that just isomorphism is good for this. Not categorical isomorphism in general. Okay. Isomorphism is okay. Mm. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't able. Yeah, sorry. I, I missed some of the chat and also Maybe I was speaking while somebody was talking, like Hayato. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, no problem. Yeah. All right. Uh, is there anything else to talk here? May maybe also one um, complication uh, that you know uh, uh, starts to yeah, become. Yeah. Uh, Chewing Chu asks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, if g if then g is equal to. Ah uh, no. Ah uh, no. Sorry, um, if, if then G and G then F is not equal. Uh, sometimes, even if F then G exists, G then F does not exist. Yeah, and also we use semicolon as well, okay? Mm. And uh, may maybe, Hayato, do you have any example where F then G is not the same as G then F? That could uh, be that's good. not the same. Mm. The, uh, in general, there is uh, for example, in this case, uh, F then G exists, mm. but G then F does not exist, mm. and uh, only the case that, for example. Uh, ah, okay, sorry. Only the case that these kind of situation have two different... In this case, F, G and G, F exist, but not necessarily necessary the same equal yeah. mm, the same like for example the differentiation and the integration mm. first uh, different uh, integrate and differentiate then uh, it is nothing and uh, not, uh, do nothing that is some kind of identity but the um, dif uh, differentiation and the integration maybe uh, give the different answer for example because the integration uh, gives yeah. you in yeah, uh, yeah, indefinitive yeah. Uh, constant yes yes yes, yeah. yes 
And also, uh, another kind of, you know, um, simple example would be like, you know, as an object A, you can have some kind of, you know, shape like, you know, this circle and the star. And then one A here um, sort of um, puts this to be the same thing and then this one to be the same. So that's that, that kind of, you know, relation as a, uh, so uh, uh, a one A relation, right? And then uh, if you have a B, and then uh, you can have a different kind of shape. And then if you if your F goes something like this, and then if your G also maps respectively, you know, this um, triangle to this dot and then uh, circle to this, then in this case, an F and G, and G then F is the same, but uh, uh, different kind of uh, example uh, yeah may maybe one only one uh, one object like this uh, maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to explain in the case in category of sets and functions then the objects are sets and the functions are arrows. In that case, consider that this F as uh, these two points to uh, the only one point, and uh, the G has some kind of a choice that this. Then, um, then F then G. F then G means F then G is some kind that these two points, F then G, uh, like this F then G uh, is, takes this to this and this to itself. So some kind of shrinking two points to one point. But the G Z F G Z F takes this point to this point itself, which is uh, just the uh, identity of. Uh, if you notice this A, this A and B, then this is it one A. Yep. I guess that's also quite a good um, example. And also here is another example from Steve uh, in chat. Um, if f is a function uh, that multiplies by two and then g is a function that adds one, then uh, f then g, uh, starting from two and then uh, once you apply F, then it, it becomes four and then add it, by, and then you get five. But then the right side, uh, if you start from, uh, you know, uh, two, then uh, just by adding one first and then multiply by two, uh, you get six. So um, yeah, in, in this case, you know, both of the situation um, doesn't give you exact uh, ma mapping of the itself, like 1a, 1b. So that's not an isomorphism. And of course, some someone may notice that if this object a and b is different, then, for example, f g, f then g, f then g, uh, f then g is uh, an arrow from a to a, and the G, on the other hand, G, F is arrow from B to B. So of course, uh, if A and B is different objects, then this has a different type. So it is trivial to uh, that, that case, the not necessarily the same. Okay. All right, then uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, is similarity relation, uh, then it's always invertible. 
And I think uh, if it's uh, in the case of the query, right, say, you know, uh, query of A is indistinguishably similar to B, then it is always invertible. And that's what we also discuss in a paper, and uh, that's called a groupoid, right? Yeah. All the arrows are invertible. Hmm. But you know, the, this again depends on the definition of the similarity arrow. Okay, if you have some kind of a similarity relations of, you know, not exactly the same or, you know, quite similar, but can be different, then if you compose it many, many times, then somehow, you know, it may not become like uh, similar in the end. So uh, that's called Soritis paradox, but uh, uh, we, we ignore that for the moment. All right. So let's move on. Sorry, sorry. Yep. Can, you, uh, can you give us some simple example of isomorphism? I mean, specific example, like what the isomorphism? Ah, so the, the example I drew was in a sense uh, isomorphism. So let's say if you have, let's say number one, two, three, and so on. And then yep. if you have an object like circle, triangle, and the square, yeah. And then the mapping of this as an F. And then yeah. if you prepare G as an uh, inverse mapping of this mm -hmm. as G, then yeah. F then G is exactly the same as 1A, right? Uh, and, yeah, uh, I understand yeah. that example, but uh, some interesting example. <laughs> Some other, you know, interesting example. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the, in the case of the query, then uh, maybe you know the all the color relations or, or the fovea, for example, and then yeah. periphery, or left side and right side, or something like that. Yeah. And then any kind of objects, you know, the location is the itself is different, but you know you can have a kind of mapping from here to here. And also yeah. you can have another mapping from here to here, and as long as your brain is completely symmetric. But if your brain somehow, you know, let's say, you know, color blind on the right side, then you can't have something like this. Right. Yeah, just I'd like to know some, you know, mathematics examples mm -hmm. or, you know, famous examples of... Okay. Yeah. Okay. In sets, in sets, uh, sets means a category of... Uh, Sets, sets as object as a function as uh, arrows, then the isomorphism is nothing but uh, uh, one to one correspondence mm -hmm. as, as now takes example. If you consider top, that means some kind of the topological space, like a figure. Yeah. Then the isomorphism, uh, sorry, the continuous maps. Then the isomorphism in this case, the isomorphism is uh, topological, um, uh, not uh, home, topological homeomorphism. Mm. So, like, of course, uh, uh -huh. uh, in group case, so, so so this kind of some um, not only uh, how to say uh, the one to one, but it uh, preserves the basic structure. So isomorphism is some kind of that that kind of thing. mathematical mathematical example. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe um. Hayato, is this example kind of uh, isomorphism or not? No, it's not isomorphism. Because it's already kind of uh, collapsing many things. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, collapsing. Yeah. So there is many topological spaces corresponding to the zero, mm. for example. Mm. But uh, Hayato said that, you know, uh, 
if A and B are isomorphic, the structure of A and B are same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I sort of intuitively couldn't understand why the you know sameness of structure is guaranteed. Ah, okay, that's very very good question. The first thing is that we should fix some C. For example, if you consider sets or tops, top or something, the groups or something, mm -hmm. then the if the two objects in a category is isomorphic, mm -hmm. then the relation to the other object like a to x yeah. and all automatically induce some uh for example if f, there is f mm -hmm. so uh, this is uh sorry um, isomorphism i j of, of maybe mm -hmm. now if you, if you given some f which relates a to f then we can consider the j zen f mm. j zen f sorry i am mathematician so it is very useful to <laughs> know to, but uh, okay j zen f uh yeah. so f gives j zen f mm. and also by uh composing i for example i like if uh, you have the, some other other relation to x like g we have the co composing uh i then g we have this i then g ah uh, okay 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 yeah so the isomorphism guarantees Mm. the re relationship uh, from A to other general object is uh -huh. completely copied by nice. the isomorphism. Yeah. Yeah. So it means that in this category, the role of A and the role of B is completely identical in that sense. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Okay. Okay. Great. So an example of that situation is with the the relationship between exponentials or logarithms, you know, mm -hmm. the exponential of um, a plus b is the same as exponential of a times exponential of b. Uh, duality or isomorphism between those, which you can set up as a category, yeah, yeah. is basically what uh, I had to just say. <laughs> yeah, that, that one is also. Um, quite a good example and also probably non-trivial but uh, more interesting kind of thing i guess um so like uh real numbers and then uh multiplication and uh real and uh, uh addition and then uh exponentiation and also logarithm mapping is I uh, can preserve the structure and also, you know, going back and forth as well. That, that's right? Yeah. Okay. So let's move on. Um, okay, so um, this is a figure from our 2016 paper and then uh, showing uh, what the functor is or um, the different levels of the sameness um, in a uh, quick uh, sort of summary. So here, uh, what we talked about is already like identity, like things and itself, or thing doesn't, um, doesn't change anything. And then uh, what we also talked about is this, you know, isomorphism. Uh, you can go from one to the other and then coming back to the same location. Okay. And then, uh, but the other more useful kind of, you know, loose uh, sameness um, is that a functor and adjunction and the equivalence. And we don't have time to go to uh, adjunction, but uh, uh, we'll talk next about functor. Okay, Hayato? Okay, uh, please note that uh, this is uh, I similarity or I uh, the sameness between categories in the uh, previous slide we discussed the 
uh, sameness in some category. So the, in this slide, we discuss the category, uh, sorry, the sameness between categories. So the level is goes up like a category of categories. Mm -hmm. So maybe the uh, audience uh, may be confused. Okay. Okay. You, you understand what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I know. I know what I mean, but uh, what, what you mean, but... Uh... Mm. Yeah, so sometimes because it, some some audiences uh, may interpret that uh, maybe there is other kind of arrows in a category like uh, the two objects like that in insets or mm. in tops or something. But but in, in this figure, mm. we discuss the, a specific category of category of categories mm. category of categories, which will be defined as the objects as category and the arrows as functors, which we will give, you will give a definition. Right. So, yeah. Okay. So uh, to move on, um, uh, this is a sort of the intuitive um, understanding of the what the functor is. And also here, uh, one category is defined as a, a category of a geometry. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he, uh, another category is a, a category of algebra. Mm -hmm. And then uh, these functor relations uh, make some kind of a correspondence between these objects and the relations into some kind of coherent uh, relations on the you know from one domain to the other and roughly speaking what we want to do with uh, also consciousness research is somewhat like this one um, two completely different kind of the domains like queria and neural activity or queria and information structure and then to make this kind of a uh, uh, relation uh, establish this type of the relations does it sound okay at all? Yeah. Okay. But is there any question so far for this? Okay. So uh, let's move on to then next, um, the definition of the functor. I think I should go to the this type of uh, formal definition first. I'll just read around first. So the definition of the functor is a uh, mapping F which maps an object and arrow in one category C to an object and arrow in another category D. Okay, so we are now talking about um, relationship between two types of the category. And each of them itself has some kind of objects and also arrows. Okay, and then uh, this mapping rule f is called a functor if it satisfies the following three conditions first is that the uh, uh, identity arrow for x and this x thing has to be you know um, uh, applicable for everything and then if you have this one f uh, one x thing then this has to also uh, map onto um, x that is mapped onto here, f of x, and its identity. So here it is, okay? And then second condition is that if there is an arrow from x to y, let's say here, then that has to also map to a relation between f of x to f of y. So if x maps onto here, and then y maps onto here, then this arrow has to correspond to what this small f is mapped by this capital F. Okay. And then uh, composition of arrow f of g, f then g in category C is preserved in f then g itself uh, mapped onto category D. 
okay? So here, this is f of f, and then this one is f of g, if this is g, then, you know, the ex uh, this type of the composition, f then g, has to correspond to f of f then g. This one itself mapped into here, which is the same as f of f then f of g. And then all of this is uh, explained in this succinct figure in a clear format. And if that happens, uh, that happens to be the case for mapping rule f, then that is called a functor. And we can talk about there isn't a relation between uh, uh, category C and the category D, which corresponds really weak similarity, uh, existence of the functor. Okay. Is, is this clear? Any, any other things to add? Um, otherwise, we might take five minute break here. Okay. Okay. All right, so then uh, it seems like it's fine. Um, we'll take five minute break.
Okay. So we'll restart. Um, there was a, a very good question from uh, Isaac uh, about this hierarchy. So he's asking whether this hierarchy is properly contained or not. And I think it's yes, uh, but Steve or Hayato, do you want to answer? Yes, yes, okay. Yes. So if um, the, the weaker one is always, you know, um, the, the strong one is always, you know, contained within the weaker one, or yeah. vice versa, the way, depending on the way you say it. Okay. And uh, also, I, I should uh, uh, mention that the functor is uh, one direction. And um, so here is uh, one example that we talked about in the paper. So let's say uh, uh, Mr. X and Mr. Y has a different kind of uh, uh, similarity experience. For let's say uh, color, you know, when you present a stimulus A and B and C, and then F or G means that uh, uh, A and B are indistinguishably similar here, and then uh, B and C are also uh, indistinguishably similar for X. Then a and then uh, C uh, can be composed as well. Uh, um, they are also indistinguishably similar. But for Mr. Y, they, are, they look completely different. So there is no arrows uh, for any of the relations, mm. okay? So this is uh, two categories, category QX and the category QY. Mm. And then in this case, uh, there are uh, many different ways to actually a uh, proposed functor actually even though you feel like you know oh there may be no functor from qy to uh, x but if you think about the way to way it's defined the important thing is that you know each of these you know uh, object has an uh, identity arrow which is not uh, mentioned um, directly here so as long as this identity arrow is preserved into identity arrows in some of these, such as uh, AY maps onto AX, BY maps onto BX, and the CY also maps onto BX, this kind of relationship, then all these uh, you know, arrows within uh, QY are preserved into QX. Mm. So that kind of functor exists. On the other hand, if you want to map uh, this you know, category QX into QY, then you need to be careful. Because if let's say you, know, you want you map to X, AX to B, uh, BX, uh, AX to AY and BX to BY, for example, then this you know, similar, indistinguishably similar arrow doesn't, you know, uh, it, it's lost somewhere. So such a functor doesn't exist, right? So the only way for QX to QY to have a functor is to all these things, A and B and C, to collapse into one of them, such as AY. Mm. Then all these, you know, F and the F, F then G, this also collapse into this one AY, and then everything is you know, preserved here. So in, in a sense, this uh, existence of the functor and also the variety of the functor or the diversity of the functor can quantify the richness structure of this you know, category QX and the QY in some way. Hayato, do you want to add something? No. This is fine? Right. Steve, fine? That's fine. So you could just say that if the category has no non-identity morphism, then the functor just re reduces to a function. Mm. Not what mm. that right. That means that this thing, this category down the bottom, mm -hmm. has no has only identity morphism. So anything going from it is is just a function, mm. essentially. Mm. Yeah. 
and that there is some questions. So any, any function in that case would be a functor, although in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, there's uh, one question from Beth. Uh, could they all collapse into BY and CY? Yes, that's also the case. So mm -hmm. instead of AY, <laughs> if everything uh, collapses into BY, that's also another functor. And also AY, AX, BX, CX, to go to CY, that's also another functor. In all three cases, uh, the structure of the QX is preserved in QY. Okay. So let's move on. Um, and also th th this kind of thing can be, um, uh, we, we also mentioned in the paper that the level of consciousness meter uh, can be considered as a functor. Uh, let's say from the phenomenology of the you know, level of consciousness to a number, there is some kind of you know correspondence uh, of larger than or equal kind of you know ex uh, relations preserved in here. But it doesn't mean that this number also you know is uh, any kind of numbers here maps onto unique you know states of consciousness or level of consciousness and its prediction of the you know uh, larger than or equal. Okay, so it's uh, unidirectional mapping is all you need for the functor. All right. So let's move on. Um, so the, this is a, probably the most you know difficult thing, and uh, you know uh, it's good that you know we arrived here uh, at the end of this uh, you know tutorial, natural transformation. And this is in fact a key concept in the category theory. And I had a, not, not really a trouble, but you know, it took me a long time to get it used to. And uh, it's probably a cornerstone of understanding category theory. And uh, once you understand this, then many interesting kind of, you know, concepts or benefits of the category theory you can uh, appreciate, <clears throat> right? And uh, in fact, uh, uh, the theory of uh, category theory has been proposed to basically propose this concept. And for that, functor was invented. And then uh, to explain functor, then the category was invented. That's the kind of the direction of the development. And uh, roughly uh, speaking, natural transformation is like a correspondence of the structure to another structure in a coherent way. Mm. Fine, Hayato. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So usually, you know, you think about some kind of, you know, components or elements and how element to element is, you know, uh, related. But we first, you know, go into the really high level abstract thing and then think about, you know, struct how the structure um, corresponds to another structure. That's the sort of the thinking that we want to make. And um, uh, uh, definition-wise, it's a bit difficult, but uh, let's let's see. So I'll just read her out. So consider two functors f and g, and each of them map the category C to a category D. May maybe it's better to go back and forth between these you know figures. <laughs> So what, what it means is that the, you need to first think about category C and then another category D, okay? Mm. And then first thing to think is that the functor F. And F maps X into FX and Y into y, F, FY. And then relation between X and Y are also mapped onto this F of F. So that's one functor. And then another functor, G, is uh, do, uh, doing something similar to functor F, but now X is uh, you know, mapped onto GX and Y is mapped onto GY. And this F is mapped onto G of F. So that, that's a sort of the first um, kind of situation, okay? And then going back to this uh, definition, when a mapping T, from functor f to g satisfies the following two conditions, then t transformation is called natural transformation. So 
If some kind of condition is satisfied, then functor f to functor g is related through this t. That's the kind of idea. Okay. And then coming back to here, and then the, what's the two condition? First condition is that given an object x in category C, t gives an arrow t of x, f, to, uh, f of x to g of uh, x in category D. What it means is that uh, here, if you have x in category C, I can't change the color anymore. Oh, here. So if you have x in category C, then you have this f of x through functor f and the g of x through functor g. And then t is this one, relationship between these. And then the second one is that for any arrow f, x to y in category C, then t of x, then g of f is exactly the same as f of f, then t of y in uh, category D. So just to come back here, what it means is that uh, if you have this kind of relations, x and y here, then you can go from here to here and then come to here or here to here and then come to here. That's the second condition. And uh, the the, these, these two things is equal is the second. Oh, yeah, yeah. Second so two, two pathways are the same. That's the second condition. Yeah, yeah thank mm. you. Okay. And one, one thing it, which took me a while for me, maybe this is a kind of the uh, typical difficulty in category theory is that the one concept is composed of many different things. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the, the different entity. So, I mean, uh, I, mm -hmm. I talked about a natural transformation, mm -hmm. but uh, the reality or sort of the, its es essence or sort of the manifestation is that it's a collection mm -hmm. of these arrows. Yeah, yeah. Parameterized by the objects in category C. Right. So, in, in a sense, one concept, natural transformation, can mm -hmm. talk about many things at mm -hmm. the same time. Yeah, yeah. Something like that is not really... I don't know whether we, mm -hmm. we have some things similar to other uh, in other theories or other tools. No, 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 no. I don't know either. Yeah. But that, that's a sort of the powerful uh, aspect yes. of this natural transformation. Yes, I think so. Yes. Uh, natural transformation is a very unique notion. Uh, and uh, how to say, the found in category theory, but um, actually, we use these things like everyday activity, like uh, uh, coordinate transformation, Fourier transformation, substitution, or something. The, the many things which preserves some structure can be recaptured in the context of uh, natural transformation. Yeah. So in a sense, like, you know, one thing to the other in like coherent way. And there, mm, if there are coherent. many ways to do it and, uh, you know, many ways are coherently related to itself, mm. then uh, they are likely to be natural transformation. Mm. Mm. I don't know whether that's uh, understandable to you guys, but... Um, this is a very special kind of natural transformation. And uh, uh, if you only want to learn about, for example, Fourier transformation, we don't need to consider natural transformation, but it is a very uh, great generalization of these kind of things. So, uh, so how to say, looking uh, retros retrospective 
perspective, then the, there are many, many natural transformations in mathematics, but it is, it is first found in the uh, development of category theory, mm. 1945. Yeah. Steve, do you want to add anything? Uh, one way to think about, well, for psychologists, particularly people who study analogies in cognitive science, mm. proportional analogy is a kind of natural transformation. The proportional analogy is the form A is to B as C is to D. Now, the, the A is to B is like an arrow from A. It is like an arrow from f of x to uh, g of x. Oh, sorry, uh, f of x to f of y, and the c of d is like an arrow from g of x to g of y, and then the as bit is the, the two-way map of those arrows. So a proportional analogy is like a second or a relation between relations. So also category theory theorists talk about uh, natural transformations like as a two-map, a map between maps, like a computer scientist would call a second order function as a function between functions and so <clears throat> the natural transformation is but like, is just a map between uh, functors so you think of a functor as like a uh, one a one dimensional map and therefore the natural transformation is a two-dimensional map mm. so <clears throat> this all comes about is because when Eulenberg and McLean first one was interested yeah. in this stuff talking talking about how do you characterize holes in space well, <clears throat> what's the lack of a natural, the lack of this, you can think of a natural transformation like a sheet, where a functor is like a line, hence the a sheet is like a, a mapping between lines. And so if you've got a hole, if we, you've got this gap where the, the naturality doesn't, doesn't uh, hold. And so that's why when you said before, the natural transformation is actually composed of lots of little things. Well, the natural transformation is, with, well, is by definition, a, a, a family of, of maps as um, parameterized by the object as I first mm. So I think the proportional analogy approach, uh, if you're familiar with analogy theory in mm. science, is, is a fairly natural way, I suppose, of getting hold on, getting a handle on sort of the elementary aspects of natural transformation. There is a crucial difference, though, of course, in the natural transformation. It's from a common source. Okay, the two functors come from the same um, category C and project into the same category D, or is it in a proportional analogy, it's really, you, you sort of omit that, that aspect of it, it's really just a comparison between the source and the target. So a natural transformation is another way of looking at it, is a, a map between the image of the functor F and the image of, of the functor G. But anyhow. Yeah. Mm. And if you write it sort of symbolically, as uh, um, cognitive psychologists like to do, it's A colon b colon colon c colon d it also suggests that notation also suggests a sort of a line versus plane idea mm. it's the single colon is a single map and the double colon is a double map in other words uh, that's also why that natural transformation sometimes drawn as the implication area as you've got there but to emphasize the that the no. natural transformation is really at a, at a higher level than the functor, which itself is at a higher level than the category. Like this way, Steve? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Okay. So you can think of the double. The uh, double okay, the, the, there is a question from Isaac. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could we get some intuition about difference between asmorphism and natural transformation? Okay, uh, first we need to understand the um, natural transformation is an arrow from functor to another functor. So, uh, and the, the second thing is that um, the not every arrow is isomorphism. Only invertible one is isomorphism. Uh, like that, the um, invertible natural transformation. Uh, is called natural equivalence or natural isomorphism. So it is uh, kind of, uh, uh, you can understand this natural equivalence or natural isomorphism as isomorphism in the category uh, called 
a functor category. So in that sense, you know, these two notions are related. This is an um, uh, answer to the first question. And the second one, Isaac's second one is that, is it that isomorphism is within category or natural? Yeah, a uh, natural transformation is between functors, not categories. But, uh, okay, uh, but interestingly, we can uh, define the equivalence between categories in terms of natural transformation. So, uh, cate uh, natu natu uh, categorical uh, equivalence of categories, equivalence between categories can be defined in terms, in terms of natural transformation. Maybe now we, we explain or not, I, yeah. I don't know. Now we yeah, that. so may, maybe we'll go, go there and then uh, mm -hmm. we'll probably finish today, I guess. Okay, okay. okay. Sounds okay? If you, if you still have time. That's okay. All right. Um, because, you know, this, um, you know, uh, question from Isaac is exactly sort of the motivation to go to the next point. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, you know, so far natural transformation is like, you know, unidirectional, right? From functor F to functor G. And then, uh, but be before going further, maybe I'll just want to uh, give you um, mm -hmm. intuition uh, here for the consciousness researcher. So let's say category C is a category of aquaria in the central vision, okay? And then within the central vision, you see that an you know, apple and berry, object A and the object B is indistinguishably similar in terms of color. So there is an um, arrow F there, okay? And then you think about, you know, functor L, which moves everything in the fovea into the left uh, visual field. And then another functor R, is uh, everything is now moved on to the right side, okay? Then the central visual field is now uh, uh, contained within this bigger entire visual field, category E, okay? So it's included in here. Mm -hmm. But then within this you know, category uh, C object 2 L or R, there is this, you know, uh, map uh, similarity here because it's you know we if you know left side and the right side has a similar kind of experience okay and then also uh, you have this and the existence of the natural transformation assures that you your redness of the apple on the left visual field is the same as that of the right field of the apple and that uh, apple's redness is the same as the berry there is a redness on the right side. And that's the same as left side uh, comparison of the apple to berry first, and then berry to berry on the right. So in a sense, all the relations within the central visual field is mapped onto the left and the right systematically. And there is a systematic relation from left to right. And that's the sort of existence of the natural transformation. We don't need to talk about the, each individual you know, correspondence one by one. The existence of the uh, natural transformation says everything coherently moved to this, to that. Okay. So far, is this example of making clear about the advantage of this natural transformation? Okay. So then this uh, functor category uh, leads to uh, I think Isaac's uh, questions. So here, um, the functor category is uh, also, you know, starts to become like, you know, more like category theory. You are, depending on your viewpoint, the same thing can be considered as category or arrow or functor. So, but, but, but I, I felt it wasn't super difficult here. Anyway, so this functor category is uh, a category where object is now a functor in other perspective. Here's what I found. Okay. So 
if you have an app uh, uh, category C and then category D, then there can be many different functor, you know, as we talked about between Mr. X and Mr. Y, right? Functor F, functor G, functor H, and so on. And then each of these functor can be now considered as, uh, considered as a object within this, you know, functor category, functor category C and then D. Then this is really easy, you know, the existence of the trans, uh, natural transformation F to G corresponds to arrow in here, right? And then G to H is also now uh, T, S, you know, um, another kind of uh, uh, arrow here. So just taking a sort of a meta, you know, one, one step above uh, kind of perspective, the relationship between the functors are now almost like the same as an object here. <clears throat> and then within this functor category, if you think about isomorphism, then uh, this is the categorical isomorphism. So once again, just to write it again, uh, categories C and E, here yeah, it's about you know, central vision and entire vision, is categorically isomorphic if there are a functor F that goes from C to E and then factor G, E to C, such that uh, this F to G, F then G is the same as one C. So what we are talking about is this, you know, functor category C and then D, and then talking about uh, category C and then uh, E here. And then functor here, F, and then functor here, G. And then if this one C thing, you know, central uh, vision thing is exactly the same as functor uh, from C to E and E to G, then that this holds. And the same goes mm -hmm. with this. But it turns out that uh, it's a very, in a way it's too uh, strict kind of uh, conditions. And I forgot why I don't have that category car equivalence thing here. So I, I, I mm -hmm. yeah, maybe Hayato, do you want to explain categorical ex equivalence? Uh huh. Rather than yeah. I well, say the something. equivalence between categories that oh, okay, the. So this is actually, uh, I pasted the categorical isomorphism actually, right? Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, wait. Category, category C and E are categorically yeah, yeah. equivalent. If the above we functors- can, we, yeah. we can generalize this equality to the equivalence. Mm. Equivalence means the isomorphism, isomorphism E, Functor CD, CE, mm. CE here. Mm. Then we have the equivalence between categories mm. between C and E. Mm. Yeah. The, this isomorphism in Functor CE is nothing but the existence of existence of uh, natural equivalence or the natural isomorphism in this C. So we can define the equivalence between categories uh, in terms of natural transformation. Okay. And then uh, this categorically equivalent mm. is uh, weaker than this isomorphism condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that, that happens if the above functors F and G have an invertible natural transformation. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe we need to define this. What is this invertible natural transformation? Yes.
So uh, when, when this uh, uh, functor f and g is invertible, uh, it doesn't require this uh, to be equal, but uh, yeah, yeah. it's loosened into this equivalent. Mm. I, I think that it, it, it is a um, uh, mis, mistype, misprint that one C, one C, two uh, F, then G, oh. and uh, yeah, G, one E, two G, then F, some maybe T and T prime, or yeah, natural transformations, T and T prime, yes. That's problematic because we we have this already. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I I found that now, but uh, yeah, it is not so uh, fatal. Okay. So, is there is there anything else to add? Uh, maybe Steve. Uh, it seems fine. It's fine. So in a sense, you know, it may not be super clear with this explanation or example, but uh, if we require this, you know, categorical isomorphism, then um, even this C and E situation, central and, uh, uh, you know, entire visual field won't work because, uh, you know, E is bigger, right? And bigger to smaller and then coming back to some kind of mapping is always, you know, different. Now, yep. well, one way to characterize natural isomorphism is with regard to your square here, is if it's a natural isomorphism, you can go from the top left-hand corner here mm. to the top right-hand corner to the bottom right-hand corner and then back again to the thing, which is the same as it. But if it's just a natural transformation, you can only go, you can't go back necessarily. And then coming back to here. Uh, no, going back uh, uh, top left, top right, bottom right, and then bottom left. This way, this way, and then this way. Yeah, and that will be equal to going from top left to the top, uh, the bottom left. Ah, okay. In the case mm -hmm. of a natural isomorphism, but not in the more general case of natural transformation. In the natural transformation, you won't have this in C2 invertible. Oh. Better here. RF inverse here. So this way, this way, this way is the yeah. same as this. That's a natural is uh, isomorphism. Yeah. And then so the effect of the natural isomorphism is that if, you, if it's difficult to go from top left top to bottom left, then sometimes it's easy to go around the square to get the same result. Whereas for natural transformation, you can't go around the square in general. You can only go um, either um, clockwise or anti-clockwise. This way or that way. Yeah, so the natural transformation only allows you to go, gives you two ways of going from the top left to the bottom right. Mm. Whereas the natural isomorphism also gives you the extra way of going back to the bottom left. Right. So in that sense, uh, this one is actually stronger condition than this one. Mm. Yeah. So this, the example about the that we mentioned before about the relationship between um, logarithms and exponentials and products and, and addition, and sometimes if you've got very big numbers or very small numbers, um, computing the direct multiplication can give you a round-off error. In the computer so you can avoid that by what the transformation will do is convert your very large numbers into smaller numbers, allow you to add them and then convert back to avoid the round-off error. The advantage of having this isomorphism, uh, natural isomorphism. Sometimes the direct computation is actually somewhat counterintuitively more difficult than the than taking the deep. Yeah. So, well, what Steve is saying is that uh, let's say you know you want to do this kind of calculation thousand times hundred, but uh, this may be actually easier. If you just uh, transform the uh, numbers itself as an object into the log of 10, 
So that's uh, base 10, that becomes like three and then two. And then this you know, multiplication is now uh, transformed into plus. Then mm. this one is exactly the same as five. And then you come back to this mm -hmm. thing. Uh, yeah. One more zero. One more. Yeah. And then uh, that's actually easier than coming to here, sometimes yeah. rounding error. And th this happens when, uh, because of this, you know, uh, exponentiation and the logarithm kind of, you know, relation is a uh, uh, natural uh, uh, isomorphism. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what Hayato is drawing here, uh, maybe do you want to explain? Yeah, it's just uh, um, what Steve said. So in natural equivalence or natural isomorphism case, we have the, this invertible arrows. So you can transform this like LF to RF by using this composition. So this is just a change of the uh, viewpoint. Ah, right, right, right. Okay, uh, Angers, mm -hmm. Angers uh, asked, why does category E have four objects that category C has two? Uh, actually, there is many, many uh, objects uh, in general or more, or only one, or, but but it is just it's just for the explanation. Uh, and wh why we choose two uh, two or four objects, we need uh, category C as some one arrow uh, at least. The and the, the natural transformation is uh, something about the between functors. Uh, so we need these things, but uh, it does not mean only four objects or something or there is many many other objects but this is just for explanation well just to add to Haito's point there another way to look at a transformation a uh, natural transformation is a map on the objects objects in the category c to the morphisms in category e since the, this family of maps here is actually indexed by the the objects mm -hmm as Haito mentioned earlier. So yeah. in that sense, it's a kind of one gets mapped to two because this mm -hmm. little apple or, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so may maybe that's a bit difficult probably. Uh, so I'll try to translate. Um, I don't know, Angus, maybe you can now tell us uh, if you understand it already, but- uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is, uh, maybe the Steve want to say is that some there is a cut to the category code two to the uh, fan CD is also notice uh, this is the another notation for fan CD uh, but uh, this is there is a relationship between the two C to D uh, uh, which does not explain already but but. Uh, yeah, in that sense, uh, the two and the four is uh, a, a little have meaning, but I think it's too difficult to explain here. Yeah, it's a. I I think it's a bit difficult, but uh, yeah, what what uh, I guess you know uh, I I'll try to explain um, in my words, but uh, when there is an um, one relation f in category mm -hmm. C, right? We want to talk about two types of a functor, L and the R. Mm. So in a sense, you need to copy yeah, these yeah. two things, yeah, yeah. right? F needs to be copied to L, L of F and R of F. And that automatically generates this, you know, corresponding rule of TA and TB. And when Hayato and also Steve talked about the indexing, indexed by object, this is what it means. I, I, it took me some time to understand what, what this indexing means. But, you know, anytime when you have an object, then there is an associated kind of rule for that particular object. That's why you see, you know, A, um, that, that signals Apple. So natural transformation itself is like, you know, signaled as a 
one small uh, letter T, mm. but T is actually a collection of T A, T B, T C, T D, blah, blah, blah. And uh, the more you have an object here from A to Z, then, you know, it is, it implies already many, 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 mm -hmm. you know, uh, arrows corresponding to that and its relation to mm -hmm. within category C. And that's, in a sense, kind of, you know, what the yeah, Hayato yeah, yeah, tried yeah, yeah. to say, right? Uh, yeah, actually, yes, 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 that's kind of. Yeah, two is, you know, yeah, a, a, one kind, two objects yeah, yeah. with one arrow yeah, is copied yeah, yeah, many times. Yeah, 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 yes, yes. Right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Angus, does it make sense? Uh, sir, the, the, the problem I'm having is intuitively, because in the previous slide you say like functor maps or does something where it matches an object in one mm. category to an object in another category. Mm. And then it also maps the morphisms to an, mm. some morphisms in another category, mm. right? Oh, yeah, and yeah. so in, in this example, you have the objects like apple and raspberry, mm. and I can see them being mapped to apple and raspberry. Mm. And you have this morphism F and it's mapped to L of F. Mm. But then in category E, you also have another apple and another raspberry. Mm. And I, I don't know, like, how, 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 where did, where, like, if, if L is a functor, why isn't it mapping the apple in category C to both apples in category or ah, something like that? Okay, so, so may, maybe, you know, this wasn't clear, but uh, it's considered, it should be considered as, you know, left hemifield apple. So if this is an apple at the center, then you know, it's called the AC and then this is, you know, to be more accurate, it's an apple at the left and also this is a berry in the left. And here is the apple in the right and also berry in the right. Okay, so just to clarify, because I, I think I might understand, but if you go to slide 14, is this a case of like what's illustrated in, in C where you have where not all the things in one category are being mapped to or something. Uh, no, 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 it's not that, that case actually. Um, we, we initially distinguish the possibility that, you know, apple on the left and the apple on the right could be perceived differently. From apple in the center, and then reevaluate whether this is actually indistinguishably similar or not. And the existence of the functor L means that the, any kind of relationship that you have at the center actually also is preserved in the left side as well. Do you see what I mean here? I am. Yeah, I, I get that, but I'm still not sure why there are things in category e, e which aren't like mapped to category C through L. Like mm -hmm. the bottom, like the mm -hmm. you have funct R which maps to the right field, mm -hmm. but I thought the functor has to map every object to every, or maybe it's not, maybe I'm wrong. You don't need uh, to map every object in one category to another yeah, category. The point the point to, to take away here is that uh, the functor just maps all the objects in C to some of the objects in it, i.e. Mm. Uh, the images of the functor. It's just like a function doesn't have to map every element in a, in a set to every element in another set. Okay, if, if that's the case, then yeah. yeah. The, the top row here is just the image of L. The bottom row here is mm. R. And they, they don't have to be the same thing. Yeah, so, like, so a functor... So a functor doesn't map doesn't necessarily have to map every object in one category to every other object. No, in just like category. a function. It, yeah, it's just like a function. It has to, every object in the category C has to be mapped, but not necessarily to every object or morphism. Yeah. Just like an expected function or a subset, for example. Yeah. So may, maybe 
then uh, what I can probably do is to copy this thing and then uh, we can actually think about the situation where ah, it's not that easy to actually do it but uh, let's say you know if you lose everything all the you know visual acuity in the periphery right and then everything looks like a you know, blurry red here on the left side and right side and then this corresponds to something similar to here right from mr y for mr y which is a phobia you can distinguish everything but for the periphery you cannot distinguish anything so upper and berry looks exactly the same but this actually works as a functor because you know similarity is now just you know uh, mapped onto the identity so it's now kind of collapsing this you know, distinct thing in the phobia and then into something really blurry in the phobia, uh, periphery but you know periphery to periphery there is this you know coherent mapping so in this case you know two objects in the center is now mapped into one through functor L and through functor R. Does it make sense? Yeah, I think so. Right. Okay. So what Steve said is that you uh, there is a possibility that functor in this arrow, uh, this is C and E maybe, uh, the functor from C to E should map every arrow in C to some arrow in E. But uh, maybe there is some arrow in E which is not mapped from C to E, like uh, the definition of functions between sets. Then sometimes you can consider the very uh, degenerate functor that every object and arrows is got, got into the one object or and uh, arrows from this object to this object in this case like like now for example okay does it make sense hopefully Yes, uh, mostly. Mostly. Mm -hmm. Well, no, another way to think about it, a functor is just as a projection of some object, some physical object, onto a wall, like a mm -hmm. And the wall is actually, generally speaking, much larger than the your pro projectors yield. Mm -hmm. And so you have a fun. And, and it's actually literally, informally, it's literally the image called the image of the functor. And so the example is actually quite nice because I mean, if we talk. Mm -hmm. And formally, the result of a functor is is an image. It's called the image of the functor. It's all the mm. and the morphism that result from applying the functor to the categories. <clears throat> and so you've got two eyes, so therefore you have two images. <clears throat> and the, the question is whether or not those images correspond in some way. So if you've got stereo vision, of course you expect them to correspond in some way. But you know, if one of your eyes has some, you have eye damage, for example, then you know the, the transformation from left to right or right to left may not not be the be very good. Mm. So think of the original object, the real object, uh, as a category, and then the functor is just some projection or image of that category of, of that object onto a screen, mm. <clears throat> and then you've got two eyes or two projectors. There you go. Two images and then you try to, to compare those two images by sliding one over the other and so your wall is actually your category e there's lots mm -hmm. of on the wall that you know, your projector doesn't touch mm. something like this mm. right Steve. yeah yeah Yeah, I think I think yeah, this is this makes it clearer for me. Mm. All right, so I guess 
we we didn't uh, go to uh, we we uh, didn't reach to Yone Dilemma, but I think it's mm -hmm. quite expected. In fact, um, I thought okay. that you know the natural transformation is gonna be most you know complicated complicated and also you know what is not category or what is category is also somewhat you know difficult to do mm -hmm. uh, difficult to explain. So yeah, today I think we we did a good job and uh, mm -hmm. so if you have any remaining question uh, just ask now or maybe uh, asking now is probably the best but if not then uh, uh, yeah excuse me can i ask a question yep uh, i have a very nice question and uh, so let me confirm uh before asking actual question let me confirm my understanding so you said in this slide the uh, the arrow f means the color of apple is Similar to color of raspberry. Yes. What? Just, what, just similar. Was the same. Yes. You said similar. Similar. Yeah. Similar. In, okay, in, then, indistinguishably I, similar. I, yeah. Then I, okay. Then I think. Um. I have, so, I have a question about regarding similarity as an arrow. Mm. For example, uh, red and purple are similar. And mm. purple and blue are similar, but mm. you know, red and blue are not similar mm. to each other. Mm. So, but if similarity is an arrow, then red and blue must be similar, mm. right? Mm. So, so you are saying basically this kind of situation, right? Yeah, yeah, right. And that's exactly the kind of the topic that Steve and uh, Hayato and I wrote in a separate paper. Uh, oh. which is uh, which uses the concept called the enriched category oh. and we we also think that in this kind of you know graded relationship is actually very important to apply category theory to you know consciousness research so we need to definitely cover that oh. and we will do okay. that oh. in a separate uh, time oh. that sounds very interesting yeah thank you yeah Is there any other question or comments? Okay, uh, then uh, that's it for today. Uh, thanks uh, you guys for listening and then attending and uh, uh, asking lots of questions. Uh, I think that's hopefully useful for you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you now. Okay, bye bye. I'll stop uh, the broadcasting right now. Mm -hmm. um, no, maybe you have five minutes or so after this. Yes, yes. Okay. Totally.